Welcome to Emotional Savvy, the Relationship Help Show. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler. If you're ready to increase your confidence in conversations and conflict, deepen your self-awareness, expand your connectedness, and enrich your relationship with yourself and other humans you care about, and even those you wish you didn't, you're in the right place. Enjoy today's episode. Hello. Have you ever, and I just know you have because you're listening to this podcast, have you ever had that feeling like, will I ever get over this nasty thing that happened to me? Will I ever recover from being with this difficult person, this relentlessly difficult person, this hijackal? And the truth is, yes, you will and you can if you want to, if you make it a priority, if you go in the right direction. And many, many times what I found in groups in my membership program and Facebook groups with clients all over the world, that they go through quite a period of time when they're just angry. They just have to rant. They just have to vent. They have to give things a name. They've got to get it out of their system for a while. But don't let that stage last too long. You can make a whole life of being in that rant and vent stage. You know, I have a new program starting at the beginning of August, and it's called Transform After Abuse. Heal, rise, trust, love. And I'm going to help you over a four-month period to do exactly what you need to do to transform after abuse. And why do I call it that? Because I want you to transform. Transform means that you change form. You can't go back to that person. You can't go back to that unwitting prey of a predator. You can't go back to being disempowered. And you can't go back to being angry all the time. So I want to really encourage you to look at, are you a little bit stuck in that stage of being angry? You know, maybe you're still going all over the internet and yes, you need to do this in the beginning to verify and validate what happened to you. But are you staying in the stage of just reading more and more and more and more and more about emotional abuse and getting stuck in there? Because that's hurting you. Once you get past the identification states, ah, yes, that is what happened to me. Then move towards getting out of it. And today's guest, Joy Idris, oh, I always want to put an N in her name, Joy Idris, is going to share what happened to her, how she overcame a nasty past and went on to thrive. And I mean a really nasty past. You know, I have one too. And I know what it takes. And that's why I do the work that I do. Because I had two hijackal parents. I, of course, then married a hijackal after having several relationships with other hijackals, of course, and afterwards continued to attract them until I did what I call waking up and smelling the herbal tea and saying, just a minute, there's a pattern here. I don't like it. I'm at the center of it. What can I do to change? And that's when I devoted my work and made it my life's mission to help people stop tolerating emotional abuse. And that's why I do the Emotional Savvy program, the podcast that you're listening to. I also have another podcast called Save Your Sanity, Help for Toxic Relationships with Hijackals and Other Toxic People. Just go to Save Your Sanity podcast and find it wherever you enjoy getting podcasts. And yes, you can find it on my website, forrelationshiphelp.com, by clicking on the Podcasts tab. So it's there for you. And lots and lots of directions, lots of insights, lots of things to help you move forward. So remember, if you've been with the relentlessly difficult person, one of those people I call hijackals, the people who hijack relationships for their own purposes and then scavenge them for power, status, and control, you'll want to listen to my other podcast, Save Your Sanity. 
And I invite you to do that. Now I invite you to stay tuned and listen to this wonderful conversation, this uplifting conversation, this encouraging conversation with Joy Idris on how you can overcome a nasty past and thrive. Hello, I'm so glad you're here, as I always am, because we have guests who in so many different ways helping the world, helping you, helping you move from where you are to where you most want to be. And today my guest is Joy Idris, and she is a transformational leader. And she's going to talk with us. I'm excited about it. She's going to talk with us about various ways, maybe some alternative ways, maybe new to you, about how to eliminate your suffering and move in a direction of, guess what? Joy. (laughs) (laughs) Makes ultimate sense, doesn't it? Welcome to the program, Joy. (laughs) Thank you, Roberta. It's so lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, when I find people that are interesting and have gifts to give and are willing to share them, of course, they're my perfect guests. And you definitely fall into that category. So let me tell everybody a little bit about you so that they can know what you most want them to hear. Joy is an author, a speaker, and an expert facilitator of deep transformational life changes, as we were saying, deep transformational life changes. And she's a qualified inner journey practitioner, a therapeutic counselor, an intuitive healer, a spiritual teacher, and guide. She's done a lot of things to make sure that she can take you on that transformational journey, including NLP, EFT, Reiki, and other energy therapies. So we're going to talk about mindfulness, dynamic mediation, and breath work. I'm very interested in that. I studied with Stanislav Grof. Um, So we've got lots of things to talk about. And you've had a great journey uh, bringing you to wisdom and the ability to help people move through their things. So what is it that drew you to this work, Joy? Oh, wow. That's that's my whole life story, really, there, in a nutshell. <laughs> uh-huh. What really drew me to it is, you know, I suffered a lot um, for a, a, a large part of my life. And that culminated in um, physical shutdown, basically. Um, so I just needed to find a way to heal somehow. And didn't really know what was causing the physical shutdown. I was, I'd had so much trauma, but I hadn't really it hadn't registered with me that that would be the cause because I used to just push it away, stuff it down, uh, put on the mask and be this life and soul of the party as much as I could, you know, until the body kind of said, you're not going anywhere, madam, until you sort yourself out. Um, And I found myself in a state of chronic fatigue, uh, tremendous pain um i'd been i I had suffered from cancer Mm. and uh, i was in a state of depression uh, so much Mm. crying i actually cried for seven years non-stop almost every day that's really um, really difficult that's amazing isn't it to, to, when i think back now to the way that that was but i was so out of touch with myself that Mm. I wasn't able to embrace any of it. It was just like I was a war-torn, weary victim to everything. Um, And and that's how I kind of entered the world, really. Um, I had um, an experience in the womb. Uh, That's where it all started. (laughs) Um, I, I was just about to be born. And it was a rainy night, stormy, you know, very gloomy. I think they say Tuesday's child is full of woe. And I was a Tuesday's <laughs> child. <laughs> um, but as I was about to be born, my father was alcoholic. And um, he was supposed to be there. And he turned up just at that moment, absolutely sodden drunk, you know. Um, my, my grandmother was there too, helping my mother with the birth. She was so angry that she picked up a heavy lead frying pan and hit him over the head with it. Mm. And she knocked him out. She knocked him unconscious. She thought she had killed him. And the shock of that 
was it went through my mother too you know she was oh my god you know and the shock went into me as a as a, a baby about to be born a fetus and i i didn't know then but i had a kind of a, an inner journey where i relived that moment and i felt myself disintegrate into a hundred thousand pieces you know just totally disintegrated and shattered uh, so I got it there and then that the world was a dangerous place, that I could be annihilated at any time. And this seemed to have borne out in my life. As I, as I came out into the world and started to live in the world, you know, from child to teenager to adult, I had experiences which kind of confirmed that. So, for example, when I was three, I was I like three, four, five, somewhere around there. I, I decided to make a cake for my mother. I wanted to surprise her. And I was very excited and it was a very playful thing to do. My mother was somewhere else in the house tidying up or something. And um, and of course, at that age, I didn't know how to do it. And I didn't see a bowl anywhere. So I just poured the flour onto a chair and, <laughs> and poured the butter onto the chair and started just playing with it, you know, to do, to do, to do. <laughs> making a holy mess mm -hmm. however my mum was a very stressed out woman and she came in and found this and she was she flew into a rage she grabbed a hold of me and she shook me my head going back and forth back and forth you know like a rag doll and and she threw me down and actually split my neck open so I ended up having to go to hospital and have stitches and of course that confirmed for me that the world is a dangerous place I'm not allowed to relax not allowed to have fun you know that uh, something could just unexpectedly come and just kill everything kill me later on I had another experience when I was uh, 14 years old where I was violently raped um, by a big heavy man who I was screaming to alert someone to come and save me but because I was screaming he put his hands around my neck so tightly that I couldn't breathe and I thought at that moment I was going to die however the adrenaline kicked in and I managed to throw him off with one big mighty heave and managed to to get away but again, it's confirmation, you know, suddenly without warning, I wasn't expecting it. I'm here faced with, you know, death. Um, so things were happening to me like that. Um, even later when I married my first husband, <clears throat> um, he was what, what I would call a narcissist. Uh, it, but he was, it, his idea was to keep me in prison, he was kind of obsessive, possessive, didn't want me to do anything or go anywhere. And if I ever tried to do anything, it would sabotage my efforts. Secretly, a lot of it I found out later. So, for example, if I got a job, he would phone up the, uh, the company manager and tell them to sack me for whatever reason he could think of. Um, but towards the, as we were coming into our seventh year of marriage, and he had tried to kill me before. So I found out there were knives, there was a electrical wires around my wrist when I was sleeping, which he switched on, plugged into the socket, but it didn't work. Um, then one night when I was sleeping, my eyes opened suddenly for no particular reason. I mean, I, I, I call it divine intervention. My eyes opened and I found a hammer coming towards my head. And I just had enough time to reach up and stop it hitting me. And that's when I decided, till death do us part does not apply here. Good. And it was the one moment when I actually had a boundary, you know, the first time in my life probably that I had a boundary there and I decided to run away. And I did. I ran as fast as my legs could carry me, uh, scared stiff that he would catch up with me, but he didn't. He did chase after me. Um, one, you know, after that, he would always seem to find a way to find out where I was. Uh, he was such a charmer to other people. People didn't believe what was going on and so he could get information out of them. And even my family, you know, he was supposed to protect me. And he would catch up with me. So there were scenarios of attempted kid kidnapping and different things going on. One of those times when I was, being, when I was kidnapped and pushed into the car and being driven um, along the motorway, with a couple of people who are supposed to be my friends, but they helped him to kidnap me. Uh, we, we experienced a crash. 
And um, again, I felt maybe he'd put a bomb in the car. You know, it was like that. I, it felt like a bomb going off and everything went into slow motion. And I'm asking myself, am I dead now? You know, am I dead? Um, fortunately, it was a saving for me because I, w I managed to be able to get away. I was taken to the hospital and at the hospital, I, I managed to get a message through to someone to come and, you know, help me to get away from him. Uh, and so I decided I needed to leave the country and I got out of the country and in that time that I got out and before he could catch up with me again, he'd got so involved in drugs and drinking himself that he died of an overdose. So I was actually saved from any more pursuing and being afraid, even though I loved him as well at the same time. It's funny how you can love someone who is so, so abusive and, and well, so you know, let me just let me just interject here, Joy. I mean, that is the nature of a hijackal, the people that I write about and talk about. Yes. Um, you've painted the picture beautifully because mm. they paint a public picture of perfection and at home they create a private place of pain. Yes. And so his friends, the world thought he was wonderful. He charmed everybody. Everybody would side with him because of course he was this wonderful person and yet at home he was behaving badly he was um maybe a little psychopathic and that he wanted to kill you because Mm -hmm. um, straight up narcissists will come at you when you're awake, but they don't come at you when you're asleep mostly. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this plotting, sitting up and plotting how to kill you and actually enjoying the trying um, is a little more than narcissism. But, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you are describing a very, very clear and classic hijackal which is I need to have power over you in every way and I will find a way to do that. And if you think you can get away from me, you can't. That makes me more determined to find you and make you more the center of my rage. Exactly. So, you know, you're certainly talking about those things. So I can see with these things in your background, these repeated th things, that it would make you what I call hijackal bait. Uh -huh. which is from all of these experiences with mom, dad, grandma, birth, and all of this, here yeah. you are going, you know, how do I, how do I please them? How do I make this work? How do I bob exactly. and weave and, you know, keep myself safe? And then this person comes along and they seem to be so loving, so mm. perfect. They're going to take me away from it all. And, you know, hijackals are chameleons. So they can put that, that act on uh, yeah. for a certain amount of time. So let me ask you this question before we continue with your great story is, did you date him for very long before you married him? Um, I dated him uh, for about 18 months, actually. Did yeah. you see red flags? Yes, yes. Some, not many. Um, I saw um, disloyalty why we were together uh, before we married. Um, Is that the same thing as cheating? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm him. interpreting that for our U.S. audience. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, he cheated yes. on me. Um, uh -huh. and, um, and sometimes, you know, didn't turn up when we had uh, appointments to meet, you know, dates. He wouldn't turn up for the dates because he was cheating. Um, right. And he was very... Um, he was very arrogant. You know, I think one of the things that attracted me to him is I, I wanted to um, bring him down from his arrogance. Isn't that strange? But there you go. That was one of the Well, things. you know, actually what probably happened there was you were a mutual challenge. I mean, mm. he, want, he wanted to show you he could have power over you and you thought that you could bring him down from his arrogance. But the other side of it mm. was that you probably really wanted him to be pleased with you too. You know that you, right. So we're not here to talk about hijackal so much, but because your story was so compelling and such a great example, I wanted to interject. So let's just leap ahead and say, how did this story cause you to go deeper into alternative therapies? Yeah. So because I had all of this going on, and because it had this result on my body, um, and I got this message that you know uh, you're not going anywhere until you deal with this. Um, I'd reached that place of saying, okay, if I can't do something this weekend, I, I had um, come across a, a healing seminar retreat kind of thing. 
if I can't do anything in this healing seminar retreat, um, I'm just going to curl up in a corner and just be comatose, you know. I don't want to mm. engage with the world at all. I've had enough. Um, but I thought, I'm going to do this as a last-ditch attempt. And so I went to this healing retreat. It was a weekend. And in that one weekend, it was through this inner journey work that I accessed all this trauma and released all of it. Mm. And I was left with a sense of peace that's never left me since. And miraculously, I was cured of the chronic fatigue that had plagued me for the, la oh. for the previous six years and 20 years of backache and depression, all gone mm. in that moment. Absolutely, I came running out of that place, jumping and dancing. And I had a 10-year-old son by then through a second marriage, which is a beautiful marriage, uh, by the way. We've been married over 30 years now. Uh, great. Uh, and he said to me, oh, I love the new mummy. <laughs> <laughs> I changed so much, complete switch. This is why I call my work truly transformational because I experienced that. I experienced mm -hmm. this releasing of everything. I came to completion about these things. Um, you know, I didn't need to hang on to these memories anymore. I recognized that nothing on the outside actually touches me on the inside. So I got in touch with a deep place that was my true power, you know, my true magnificence. And, and I started to live from that place. And I was so wowed by this that it became my why. You know, it's my purpose now to spread this throughout the world and let people know that they can let go of suffering and really step into their joy. You know, it's, it's a true experience. It's not just something you dream about, but it can actually happen. And I know how to make it happen. You know, come on. <laughs> Let's do well, it. Well, great. So it was that actually uh, the inner journey work that you now do? Was that it was the inner journey that? work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I was so amazed with it, I decided to uh, to train in that method. So it took me a couple of years to do that. And, uh, and I was with the team for a while, you know, uh, taking on clients and so on uh, and, and doing the seminars with them. Great. And then I just developed my private practice. And so as a result of that transformation, what did that teach you about dealing with the fear of conflict or the fear of impending conflict? It taught me a lot. It, it, it taught me that, um, first of all, in order to deal with the fear of conflict, you need to acknowledge where that fear is coming from. You need to be able to bring that into consciousness acknowledge it, embrace it with love and compassion and allow it to be um, resolved. Um, any trauma from the past, you know, because these things, you know, when we've had these experiences, we project that into, into the future and become afraid of anything that could, you know, be triggered by, by that. So it's just learning to acknowledge what's here, learning to let go of that. That would be, you know, what I would say is fundamental. And then from there, we need to um, clear a space for ourselves to connect, to reconnect. Because I think, you know, a lot of when we're having these traumas in the past, we, we close down, we shut down or we put ourselves away. You know, I lost contact with myself as a, as a young child and a girl and young adult. Um, I just put her away in some kind of cage or box, you know. So we need to be able to open that box, open the cage, let that out and really get in touch with this um, wider sense of who we are, you know, as, a, as a, a true knowing experience. So I, I do that through meditative work, um, through mindfulness, and we do it through the breathing. So, you know, our inner wisdom, our connection with self comes through stillness. Mm -hmm, and the yeah. way through the stillness is through meditation, through breathing, through mindfulness, through connecting with the body. You know, our inner wisdom is in the body. So once we connect with that and just focus inwards and allow that space to be there, that stillness, our answers start to arrive. You know, we just open ourselves. It's a case of remembering our, our true selves, isn't it, you know? Well, it certainly is. And, you know, for those of us who are joining us, my guest today is Joy Idris, and we're talking about transformational work. And yes, that's a great big catch term sometimes. It kind of goes right over our head these days. The same way what Joy was just saying about we need to 
to get in touch with ourselves, sometimes we don't really hear those words anymore because they're spoken so frequently. But what we're talking about is really deep stuff, and I hope that you're enjoying listening to this and listening to Joy's journey. Uh, when you want to hear more about Joy, just in case you have to run off or you miss something, you want to go to trulytransformational.co.uk, trulytransformational.co.uk. CO.UK. And uh, there's much there for you. I went and visited, and she gives you some very clear ideas about how she will help you with this work. So, yes, I mean, this journey to ourselves, sometimes as soon as somebody says, and you know, I've I've studied yoga since I was 19. Um, mm. So I have a PhD in psychology, but I have this whole other life that deals with alternative ways of managing our lives. So I resonate completely with what you're saying. Mm. And so when, when we hear this, you've got to get back to yourself. Sometimes when people talk about getting there through the silence, other people hear, oh, no, I don't want to do that. You know, I'm afraid to sit, fall silent. Um, I know that, that you've written some things about this. My partner and I, Charles Anderson, we wrote a book called Soul Solitude. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and that, that's important for us to be able to, as we say in the book, sit, fall silent, and listen. Yes. And many times people don't want to do that. They, and they get all caught up in the trappings, you know. If you study meditation, which I've done all over the world, you know, some people say you need music. Some people say you should never have music. You need a candle. You need to sit in a certain way. You need a mudra. Your hands have to be a certain way. There's so many things. So mm -hmm. I wanted to write a book. Charles and I wrote the book to demystify that because really the whole thing about what Joy's talking about and what I am agreeing with is that we really do need to be willing to spend time with ourselves and sit, fall silent, and listen. Yes, yes. And mm. it's not a fearful experience. It's just one that you have to believe you deserve. Yes. I think it, it can sometimes be a fearful experience at first because what happens is when you open to that stillness, you're um, giving permission for stuff to come up that needs to come up and be free but that's so, the fear isn't it that stuff yeah. will come up and i'll have to look at something and, and you know <laughs> what's there for me and will i like it and yeah. and will that be okay but, that's a but i think the thing to remember is that we're bigger than than anything that comes up you know and when you sit in that stillness you you come to recognize that you know it's, it's almost like we're an ocean and our stuff is like a droplet of oil you know and if you mm -hmm. drop that into the ocean it just gets absorbed and dissipated and dissipated uh you know so it, it really is that understanding that we are much bigger than anything that happens to us and that we can embrace that and we can learn so much from just opening and allowing that to be love is here for us you know compassion is here for us wisdom is here for us and i think when we do that um we we find the answers of how to deal with conflict in relationships because we get to recognize our self-worth, our self-value. We get to understand what boundary setting is all about, that it's not just about resistance or defense or you know how, how the ego might see it or a fearful part of you might see it. But it's about empowering both yourself and allowing the other person to be empowered or to actually take responsibility for themselves instead of us trying to fix them or control things you know it's like no this is me this is where i'm at this is what i accept and don't accept and then you can sort yourself out mate <laughs> <laughs> well it's like that you know and i'm explaining it to clients um i say you know you can come at each other this way or you mm. can come at each other this way. You can sit mm. down and figure it out. Or you can duke it out. Which do you prefer? Yeah. Right? So there are all kinds of permutations about this. But I, I really love the essence of what you're saying, Joy, that we have choice. And when we can understand that we are at choice for what we accept and what we welcome, and that we need to be very clear about that. And mm -hmm. by going within, we can become clear about that. Now, before our time dissipates, I'd like to ask you about another area of your work, which is cross-cultural ideas. And, you know, when somebody marries someone from another culture, there's a learning curve, isn't there? Talk about oh, that for a bit. I mean, when I first met my husband, he spoke 
Arabic and about five words of English. And, and I spoke English and about 20 words of Arabic. <laughs> Um, so, you know, we had to learn from the get go, you know, how to communicate with each other. And one thing that was really good about that was that we learned to uh, imagine the best from each other. What would be the best interpretation of what that person is trying to get across? So that, you know, that actually helped. Uh, but we were like, you know, chalk and cheese. We were, you know, black and white. You know, it was just everything was so opposite. It was amazing how opposite we were. Uh, and, you know, it, it was also trying to work out um, what was culture and what was personality, you know, because it gets so mixed in, I'm, you know, we, when we had difficulties in um, coming to understand each other, is this, are you being mean or is, you know, is, just, is this just the way you express yourself in your culture? You know, <laughs> so we had to really kind of pull things apart and, you know, find out where they were coming from. And I think... Um, uh, for me, I was very fortunate that I, I met a man who was uh, very kind and 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 um, and very gentle and and and, and very accepting. It's, it, it's not that common in the culture that I married into. Um, a, a lot of Arabic Arabic men are um, very kind of um, I don't know. I, I imagine like army men. It's like they. They expect everything to be for them, you know, like when they come home, get the slippers out, get the food out, you know, all this, you know, no question. And there's no, no emotion to be expressed. It's just, you know, I don't know how to explain that really, but it can cause difficulties in a relationship if you don't know that that is the culture, you know, I, I don't think I would have been able to have survived a relationship like that. <laughs> Um, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to survive it, but I wouldn't want to be in it, and I probably wouldn't last two seconds anyway. You know, <laughs> because I'd speak up, and then we'd have a culture clash, and I might understand it. But you know, in a in an intimate relationship, there's no room for for there to be that, except in the cultures where that is acceptable. You know, yeah. so when we when we two cultures come together, where one believes that they're dominant. Now, I was traveling in India, and I was going from New Delhi up to um, Dharamsala, and I went through um, Chandigarh, and I could not believe the difference. Now, I know you're talking about Arabic men, but in this case, I'm talking about Indian men, and. They would stand in my way on the street to make me go around them. Wow. Right? Yeah. And then when I was in Rishikesh, men would actually seem to be walking down the street towards you, but as you got toward them, they got close and they would touch your private parts to see if they could get away with it. Oh, right? There were things that went on. Mm. So I, you know, I have some personal relationship with what you're discussing because when you mm. have two very different cultures, what's acceptable or expected can be very, very different. So with mm. your limited communication in terms of words, <laughs> how did you navigate that territory? I learned Arabic and he learned English. <laughs> <laughs> Good start to be able to at least speak to one another. <laughs> and um, I also, I, he's, he's Muslim, so I read the Quran uh, because I wanted to see how that defined his thinking because he was quite religious. Um, and as I was reading the Quran, <clears throat> for me, I saw the truth in it and so I became Muslim. So that kind of helped as well so, because we were on the same page uh, in our worship, um, which for me, you know, the relationship with God is probably the most important thing that needs to be in place for me to have a, a solid relationship with my partner. Um, so that was that really worked out well. Uh, one of the things that was tough for me was that his mother came to live with us. Oh. and you know in the culture it's perfectly fine oh. it's acceptable mm -hmm. um his father had died when he was two so even more acceptable and here's me i'm wanting to have you know a nuclear family just me him and my child and you know have our own kind of um uh, way of living 
right. work it out together. I wanted him to cook with me. And of course, he didn't want to cook. He didn't, he didn't know how to cook and he didn't want to cook. And his mother wanted to do the cooking. So she took over the kitchen and, you know, all of these things, um, which are all things that I had to um, uh, deal with and um, work through. His relationship with his mother was such that he, she was more important than I was. And yes. I had to come to terms with that. Primary uh, not only because of the culture, but also because his father had died when he was two. And so I think he had made that commitment from that age. So I, I kind of got that after a little while, that that's it's not going to change. Although I tried my best to change it. <laughs> uh, but I eventually, you know, succumbed to all of that. So we ended up, you know, living in the same household. She's gone now. She passed away about uh, five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, but that really was a challenge. I think you're bringing up an interesting distinction too, because when you you spoke of that reading the Quran made the uh, um, Muslim tradition, the Muslim spiritual reality um, available to you, it did not mean that all of a sudden you were like extremely interested in Sharia law. I I think that what we're we're talking about here is such an important conversation because when spiritual principles make sense to you, whatever name is on them is yeah. not really important. Exactly. Exactly. For me it's one God and one message. I, oh for me too. So let's just talk about your work a little more. How do you make it possible for uh, childhood trauma and low self-worth to be improved and how long do people have to work with you in order to see a change? My uh, sessions generally last about three hours and the transformation can happen in that three hours, a miraculous transformation. Um, if we're dealing with one trauma, we might, you know, go ahead and have more sessions to deal with other traumas or other issues. But usually when the person comes with an issue, it's dealt with completely and utterly. Um, for example, one of my, my clients, she had a, a husband who was always abusive. He was always shouting, you're stupid, you're stupid. Um, and, and over the years, she had, you know, to become very low self-worth and you know self-esteem and she was in tears when she came to me and her you know her marriage was um, she didn't want the marriage to break down she had you know three three children she didn't want that to to upset the children um and at the session that we had she got in touch with her true self-worth and she she saw the roots of where that came from in her childhood and she was able to come to a completion. What we do very often, we will have like an imaginary conversation inside of us uh, with the, the parents and whoever else might have been involved at that time that kind of led her to believe that she wasn't worth anything. Um, pivotal moment. And, and then she kind of releases everything that she needs to say. So it's all get, it all gets acknowledged. She hears back. It's a back and forth thing. So everybody is complete. And she comes to forgiveness and and that creates a space for her to then open up to and connect with her true self-worth which you know you realize that that was all a story in the first place and that's not who you truly are and so on um i could go into that more but i think it would take too long <laughs> okay well so, let me just ask a question because yeah. you know when i hear that i immediately get concerned about one thing Mm -hmm. uh, which people come to me with this one thing and they say, well, shouldn't I be living this way? Like if I have a spiritual belief system that embraces the idea of pouring love and I am with an abusive partner and the more love that I, I give him, the more he takes advantage of me. And you've had examples of that in your life. Uh, what do you do with that? Because I'd like to know the answer to that. And then I'd also like to know what your definition of forgiveness is. Okay. So by her getting in touch with her self-worth and her real value, she was then able to um, be strong in asserting her boundaries. And the behavior that came out for her was next time he's, he shouted at her with this abusive language she said that's an interesting point of view it's not my point of view and it went boom, straight past so it didn't have anywhere to bounce off of mm -hmm. so within a very short space of time he actually changed his behavior 
adapting to her new strength. And their relationship got more intimate and more loving and less abusive because she believed in herself and she, was, she had the love for herself now and she was strong enough to assert her boundaries. And um, she was amazed by that. She, she wasn't expecting her partner to change necessarily. She was willing just to be her best self. Mm -hmm. uh, she, in, within the actual process she, she went back to a memory in childhood uh, where she spoke to whoever was involved and they you know you just go back and forth emptying, emptying, emptying it's like having therapy, a year's therapy in one little hour session or something you know, while they're doing that um, but it's not about blame or you did this and I did that it's more about emptying feelings I felt put down, I felt rejected, I felt abused, you know, I felt depressed, I felt lonely, I felt dis desperate, you know, and, and then the parents. So you speak at a personality level and then you go deeper and speak at a soul level. Mm -hmm. So then what you find is that usually what will happen is that the other person will say, oh, I didn't realize that I was having such an effect on you, I'm so sorry. And so, you know, the person, the, the child is gets it that, actually it wasn't so intentional and, and they can um they don't have to take that definition on board anymore you know and the forgiveness is just about it's about letting go of that because you've said everything needs to be said there's nothing more to be said so it's just time to let go so that's what forgiveness is about really for me it's it's it's, it's just time to let go and then what happens on a physical level is that the cell carries memory and when that cell dies it passes on its memory to the next generation of cells however if we interrupt that memory as we do in this inner journey work and empty out all of that trauma and finish it and complete it then we and then we've created a space in the cell and we fill that with resources that the, the client chooses for herself so she might choose to breathe in and this is where the breathing as well helps you know you breathe in self-confidence you breathe in self-love you breathe in self-compassion or understanding the bigger picture or you know all of these kind of things that you choose for yourself trusting god you know whatever it is um and then when that cell dies it passes on the new resources because given a choice between lower energy resources and higher energy it will always pass on the higher so over time your body becomes an embodiment of the new the or the remembered uh, self rather than the traumatic stuff mm -hmm. um you know so it's actually embodied in you so um you you know the right choices to make it just it, it's clear to you you know you don't have to work it out in your head it just it, it's more of an intuitive process and that lady she was so wowed by this process she transformed immediately that she decided to take mindfulness into the workplace. She had a passion now to do this, <laughs> this kind of work. And it was a, a geeky multinational corporation. And she managed to create a position for herself. And she's teaching mindfulness and meditation worldwide within that corporation. How lovely. That's a lovely story and a lovely result. You know, I, I, I do have to inject for everybody listening that this is not a guarantee. This is something that will make you better, but it may not make another human being better. Um, <laughs> so so just remember that you're, this is something that you're doing for yourself and something really lovely. I'm really enjoying hearing about this, Joy. And remember, if you'd like to hear more from Joy Idris, you can go to Truly Transformational dot co dot uk and learn more about her work and it's very important work and thank you so much for sharing it with us today thank you for inviting me i've really enjoyed our session together <laughs> yeah my pleasure and i'm sure we've got lots more to talk about joy has a gift for you it's called how to be in a relationship with quotes around the word be so how to be in a relationship taking a deeper look at what relationship issues are all about and you can find that when you go to her website truly transformational.co.uk uh, I'm sure you'll find it easily there, but if you want to do it, put in the URL and then put how to be in relationships with dashes between the words, but I'm sure there's a way to find the free gift anyway. So 
I enjoyed our conversation, Joy, and everybody, I hope if you um, want to learn more about the inner journey and that you're ready for an inner journey, that you will go and explore Joy's work. I'm Dr. Roberta Shaler, the Relationship Help Doctor. I'm always here for you. Come on over to forrelationshiphelp.com, F-O-R, relationshiphelp.com. Become a member at Optimize Circles. And also, remember that every Monday night at 6 p.m. Pacific time, I have a live stream show called Help for Toxic Relationships on YouTube. So you can join in, ask your questions, share your insights and learnings there too. So today my guest has been Joy Idris. You can find her at trulytransformational.co.uk and I really hope you will. Share this episode with your friends if you enjoyed it and found value. Go back and listen to the others wherever you prefer to get your podcasts and I'll look forward to speaking with you again really soon. And in the meantime, take good care of yourself and remember, you matter. Bye-bye. Thanks for being here for today's episode of Emotional Savvy. If you want to deepen your emotional savvy, make shifts in your relationships, and enjoy life and relationships more, work with me, Dr. Roberta Shaler. Get my books, enjoy my courses, or work with me directly. You can do that by visiting forrelationshiphelp.com, F-O-R, relationship, H-E-L-P.com, and subscribe to Tips for Relationships now. Don't miss a thing. Be empowered this week with more emotional savvy.